So as everybody knows, we have a little treat later at 8.45. Mark Crossfield is going to pop in and talk with Scott. And um, it'll be an interesting little chat for you. Um, thank you very much for signing on for the last day. Today we have Dr. Scott Lynn, and he's going to go on with ground reaction forces and another presentation then this evening at 8.45 with Mark Crossfield. So Scott, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Sergio. This is great. I think this stuff is, uh, it's helpful for me to find out, you know, what people are um, wanting to know, you know, what are people are wanting to learn about. Um, so feel free to type in the chat question and answer thing there if you have any questions as I get going, because I uh, I took a guess at what stuff people might want to want to learn about today, but um, I don't know if uh, um, if anything that comes up that you guys want to don't want me to talk more about, for, uh, go ahead and type in the box. I have no problem uh, altering what I was going to present and presenting what you guys want to hear about. So um, there we go. So let's do that. So I'll share my screen here and do this. All right. So I think a lot of this stuff, I don't know if many people have done or if anyone has done the um, the level two, um, I'll just keep the chat open here in case people have questions. Um, the level two swing catalyst certification um, online that we did um, in the early part of the lockdown, I think it was around May when we did that one. Uh, so if you have done that, some of this might be a little bit of review or if you're on Sergio's uh, Sergio's previous lockdown learning sessions, then uh, you might this might be a little bit of review as well, but I tried to include some new stuff that we've been thinking about and talking about and working on. Um, and so the key message that I always tell to um, all golf instructors is that human beings are extremely variable. Um, I've been doing golf biomechanics research now for, whew, geez, I think I started doing it in around 2007. So it's gonna be going on 13 years I've been doing golf biomechanics research. And um, one of the main findings I've found is that every human moves differently. Every human moves that club differently. Um, and there's lots of different ways to make it happen. There's lots of ways to, to make an effective golf swing. Um, and so if you try to teach the same mechanics to every single golfer, you're probably gonna mess up a lot of golfers because there may be some things that they're doing that may be a little bit unconventional, but will work for them. And so what my journey through golf biomechanics has been in trying to account for that variability in golfers um, so that a golf teacher on the lesson tee can figure out, okay, what are the things that this person is doing that are kind of a good match for them? What are the things that they're doing that isn't a very good match for them and they can figure out you know what pieces to add or take away from it and what things to leave in there um that's one thing that really fascinates me is uh what some people actually or what some golf teachers are smart enough to leave into golf swings so i mean i've talked to george gankis quite a bit about when matt wolf showed up how did you leave a lot of that alone how did you just think no that's cool let's let them keep doing that um that's a really cool strategy because or a really cool thing to think about because i think a lot of people if that kid had shown up to their door to take lessons you know whatever it was 10 years ago or whatever it's been that George has been working with, uh, a lot of us probably would have messed with some things that that George left alone and he's turned into a pretty good player because of it. Um, and would he not have turned into a good player if George messed with some of those things? That's a pretty interesting question. Um, and then, you know, Justin Thomas, I was just on the range at uh, the Bears Club in Florida a couple of weeks ago, or a couple of days ago, actually. Um, and Justin Thomas was on the range with his dad and his dad's been his coach his whole life. And um, I remember being on the range as a kid um, and kids that were jumping in their downswings, um, the golf teachers got on their hands and knees and held their feet on the ground. I remember being there. I was never one who jumped, like literally my feet didn't, you know, my feet never left the ground, although I do produce quite a bit of vertical forces in my swing. Um, but that was something that, you know, if Justin Thomas's dad had done what those golf teachers at the clinics I used to go to did to him. So if he had got on his hands and knees and held his feet on the ground, most of us would never know who Justin, Justin uh, Thomas is right now because he would have taken away one of his his primary ground reaction force strategies to produce the, the golf swing that he produces. So um, that's something that's that's uh, really important is understanding that variability. And so that's kind of been my quest through the science that I've done so far. And we're gonna talk mostly about how how I kind of use that in uh, in ground reaction force technology. Um, and one of, my best, one of my favorite quotes is human beings are messy. People are messy. There's lots of different things that might enter into why they swing the club the way that they do. So there could be movement factors, there could be, you know, previous sports they've played. I think a lot of the reasons why I swing the club the way I do is because I grew up in Canada. Um, and the first athletic thing I ever did was ice hockey. So the first time I tried to create speed with a stick in my hand, I had skates on and I was on ice. Um, that makes me move a lot differently than somebody who might have grown up, you know, doing different things um, as a kid. And so 
Um, these are all things that I like to think about and, and try to understand why each person swings the club the way they do and how, how obviously for you guys who are teaching golf, how can we optimize uh, what the person standing in front of you can do? Um, because, you know, a lot of, you know, maybe some other models would be, hey, like, you know, this joint is restricted and you can't do this and you can't do that. And well, okay, but what can I do? Um, and so how do you match up? Because, you know, most of our golfers that show up for their lessons aren't going to go to the gym and spend a whole bunch of time changing movement patterns to allow them to do some some things in their golf swings, maybe. And so how do we take that body, just how it's moving and how it's working and how it's thinking and right now and make it more optimally or more fun to hit the ball and go find it and hit it again? Um, and so um, that's kind of what we're going to get into is some of the ways to, to start thinking about that. Uh, but what I'm going to start with is some some really cool anecdotal examples that we've found um, relating to footwear and how footwear can affect your ground reaction forces. So Leon's on this call. He's helped us with some of this research that we've got into recently. Um, and all this research has been based around anecdotal evidence. So um, we've had a few times where we've had some really good golfers on the plate and we looked at them wearing different shoes and we saw some really interesting differences in, in how they could swing the golf club. And um, I always tell golfers, you know, swing catalyst and any ground reaction force measurement technologies measures the golfer's connection to the ground. Um, but what's between the golfer and the ground? Well, their shoes. And so obviously, if we put a different thing between them and the ground, that might alter how they push into the ground, which could alter how their bodies move, which could alter how the club moves, which could create a completely different ball flight, uh, completely different type of swing. Um, and so just to talk about some of the um, some of the anecdotal evidence that we've come across so far, um, one was with Ricky Fowler. So. I believe this was 2014. I started working with Swing Catalyst in 2015. So in 2014, uh, Swing Catalyst set up a plate on the on the driving range um, at one of the PGA Tour events, and Ricky came by and hit some shots. And you can see this is Ricky's pattern uh, of center of pressure movement throughout the golf swing. And you can see that he kind of lows into the ball of his foot here, and then that center of pressure dot drops very quickly into his heel. And you can see that by by left arm parallel. Uh, there's a little noise in the background, Sergio. Can we? Uh, mute whoever that is um hey, let me check hold on let me... okay oh there we go perfect um and so when you get to that uh or so so he gets to about 80 percent uh, or 78 percent of pressure into his lead side by left arm parallel on the downswing and then that pressure just drops really quickly into his heel and, and you'll see that quite a bit where the pressure drops into the heel of the lead foot on the downswing and most of the time um what we talk about or some of our research has found with our pressure plate is this little line that we draw this little thin gray line there that you can see uh, between the center of pressure in the right foot and the left foot where that line points can have a big uh big effect on where the path of the club or the swing direction of the club goes um, so you can see that as Ricky drops that uh, ball down to uh, towards his heel, this this ball is obviously going to drop down towards his heel as well, which is going to create, you know, a more leftward swing direction. So this is his lead foot, this is his trail foot. Um, you'll see that quite a bit. A lot of good players who, who have a lot of speed have at some point probably struggled with a too far rightward path and blocks and hooks. And so you'll see that drop into the heel quite a bit. Um, and if you look at Ricky's stats from the year that we took this, they were pretty good. Uh, Ricky only really had one year that's kind of an outlier where he didn't make the tour championship and had, had, a, had a not such a good year. Um, and so, and that was this year. Um, so uh, this was 2016, the very start of 2016. Um, I got a chance to measure Ricky Fowler at a course called Bear Creek um, in Murrieta, California. So I went out there and I was working with this guy in the red, uh, who's a web.com or whatever you call it, Corn Ferry Tour player. Uh, that's Phil Mickelson right there with his back to us with the black and that's Tom Pernice Jr. So they were all playing a, uh, a practice round. So I went out there to measure them because I was working with this guy, set up my plate and Ricky came up and Ricky's parents live just beyond this tree right here. Uh, and so he drove up in his golf cart he got out of his cart and said, hey, guys, take a look at these shoes I just found or I just got from Puma. And this was obviously the start of the year, the start of January, when, you know, all the companies are putting out their new gear. And I don't know if you remember 2016, but Ricky wore these shoes that looked like George Jetson space boots. They had a little metal cuff around the ankle. And so he, he's like, hey, guys, check out these. And he like tucks his pants into them. I think it was more of an aesthetic thing than anything. Um, but you can see if you put a... a a cuff around your ankle, a metal cuff around your ankle, that's probably going to impede your dorsiflexion. Um, and if you are a player who likes to get the pressure into the ball of their foot by left arm parallel, you're going to need to dorsiflex your ankle, right? You're going to have to need to get that tibia over top of your foot to get that pressure into the ball of your foot. And, and if you got a metal cuff on there that won't let you get there, 
um, then you might be in trouble. So you could see here he's gone from 78% into the ball of his foot and a really steep cliff down into the heel to now only 69% in the ball of his foot and now more of a, you know, a slight hill rather than a cliff down into his heel. And so this is a completely different golf swing. Um, and obviously there's a million things that can affect how, how a golfer might play. Um, but that could be one thing, those shoes and, and one, uh, you know, piece of evidence that supports that fact is that he didn't wear these shoes very long. Uh, he wore them for, I think about half of that season or maybe the full season for contract reasons or whatever. And then he was done with them the next year, found some better shoes, um, and played a lot better. So, um, Again, I think that's something that, you know, as you're working with your players, um, optimizing their shoe or their footwear could be pretty important. Um, and most people just choose footwear based on uh, aesthetics, right? I, I've got my, you know, my blue shirt on today, so I'm going to wear my white shoe or whatever shoes that match that, right? So it's mainly a, a fashion statement rather than a performance statement, which is something I think we need to think about a little bit more. I uh, also saw this with Suzanne Pedersen, who is a partial owner of Swing Catalyst. Uh, one year at the PGA show, she came by to hit some shots for us in our booth. And she was hitting, I believe, an 8-iron. You can see these numbers for Suzanne for an 8-iron are not very good. I also, I'm not sure if you've ever seen a launch monitor to give you more uh, carry than total. So it had like five yards of backspin on it. Um, pretty strange. I've never seen a launch monitor to give me more carry than total. Uh, after this or before this, I've never seen <laughs> other than this. So she was obviously hitting some really weird shots. Um, and, and this distance is not so good for her for an eight iron. Um, and then if you look at her shoes here, I remember looking at, so she was getting kind of upset about what the launch monitor was showing. She's a little bit competitive. Um, and so she's like, what, what do you see here? What, like, what's the problem? Oh, and I went forward one. Um, and I, had, I just met her, so I didn't really know. But one thing I noticed that stood out to me was you can see that her center of pressure pattern loads into her heel. And then there's this straight dive towards the toes here. Um, and this straight vertical, almost a vertical movement of the center of pressure is something that I hadn't really seen before this. I've seen it since then, but before then I hadn't really seen it. Um, and I wasn't sure why it was happening, but it was happening on every swing. And then I looked at her shoes and I said, are, are those the normal shoes you wear to play golf? And she's like, oh, no, no, no. These are like, and I don't know if you can see, but these are Nike kind of high heeled running shoes. So they're, they're women's kind of fashion shoes that have a really high heel on them. Um, and so my hypothesis was when she tried to load into her heel on the backswing, those, that big high heel just kind of shoved her into the ball of her foot and then she like fell forward, uh, which could be creating some weird impacts and a whole bunch of weird things. So I asked her if she would hit some shots with her shoes off just to see what happens. Uh, so she's like, yeah, sure, no problem. So she took her shoes off and the very first shot she hit after she took her shoes off, it now looked like this. So now we see she's in her socks, which you would expect, you know, less friction, you know, less speed, all those things, but her speed and her carry distance, the total went up to more normal numbers. Uh, and you can see, and we lost that little fall towards the toes. Um, and so for her, she wears very flat kind of um, Nike, they're almost like Nike free running shoes or golf shoes that she wears when she plays. Um, and so those shoes were completely throwing off her, um, her swing. And that's something that, you know, if you work with players who come for a lesson wearing the shoes they just wore to work that day, um, if they got big high heeled, you know, dress shoes on or whatever, um, that could really affect how they swing the golf club. And so um, dialing in footwear and not practicing in shoes that you wouldn't play in is probably pretty important because you might dial in your swing for the shoes you practice in and then get out and play in different shoes. And then um, that changes the whole way that you can put forces into the ground and it could change the mechanics of the swing completely. Uh, we also saw this with Jordan Spieth. So our... Uh, our sales manager in the U.S., um, Tim Dijarlet, um, he did an event with Under Armour uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., um, and they, Jordan came in and as they were setting up the plate and just wanted to hit a couple shots as they were setting up for this big event, and you can see he's just in his like street clothes with his running shoes on, whatever, and he hits a bunch of shots, and you can see he can only get 149% vertical, so way below the tour average of his vertical force, um, and in kind of his street shoes, running shoes, whatever. So then he went off and did some interviews, um, changed into his Under Armour gear and came back. And the next shot he hit after he came back, he was now up to 184% vertical. Um, are some issues here with the timing of his vertical force? I'll get into timing later and what's important with timing, but still that's a lot more vertical force. And you can see that's one of his dominant ground reaction force patterns. So in the Swing Catalyst software, we always give you these black bands. These are the tour averages, the middle of the black band, the top is tour average plus one standard deviation, and the bottom is tour average minus one standard deviation. 
So we've got one, two, three of those bands. And the reason these bands are on here, I think why they're so effective is they, they tell you how much is a lot and how much is a little. Because if I told you, you have 13%, uh, that's your maximum horizontal force of your body weight in the golf swing, you'd be like, okay, you're like how much is that? Is that a lot? Is that a little? I have no idea. And so this gives you some idea of how much is a lot and how much is a little. And that's something I do the first time I look at anyone swing on, on, uh, on the ground reaction force plate is determine what is their dominant ground reaction force. So you can see this one's in the middle of the tour average. So vertical would be his dominant one. Uh, torque doesn't even make it halfway up to the tour average and horizontal barely gets to the bottom. So that would be his dominant ground reaction force pattern. So obviously hitting balls in running shoes, which uh, blunts those uh, vertical forces probably isn't ideal. And so after um, Under Armour saw this example at this event, um, they commissioned a little study for us to do. Um, and I know Leon was part of it. He's probably collected some data. I'm sure he's collected some data for us. And we have all our ambassadors across the world uh, collecting data with some different shoes. And, and some of the early results basically are saying that everybody's different, uh, which is basically what we thought. You know, everybody responds differently to different shoes. And so, um, you know, some people respond better to a stiffer shoe. Some people respond better to a, a less stiff shoe. And there's a whole bunch of reasons um, that we need to start to get into once we figure out that, hey, like, you know, some people play better in this type of shoe, some people play better in those types of shoes, and how can you understand which person plays better and what type of shoe is the type of stuff we'll get into after uh, we get through this initial um, initial round of, uh, of research we're doing with Under Armour. So that's something that Swing Catalyst is working on and something that hopefully you guys can start thinking about a little more in your lessons um, in terms of dialing in footwear for each of your players. Uh, next, we're going to get into uh, the 3D ground reaction forces that occur in the golf swing. So these are all examples of Newton's third law. So Newton's third law is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And so the main example that golfers are aware of for this is, is the term ground reaction forces. So what that means is uh, when I push into the ground as a golfer in one direction, uh, the ground then pushes back up into me in the opposite direction. Um, so this here is an animation from my lab in uh, California. Um, and so this was Kevin Chappell. So Kevin Chappell is the best player I've had into my lab uh, and collected 3D ground or 3D um, kinematics. So you can see we've got markers all over the body uh, and the club. So we can see how the club and the body move in 3D space. Um, and then we have him standing with one foot on two separate force platforms. Uh, and these little blue arrows here are the ground reaction forces that come back up out of the ground. And so if I stop it kind of right, let's move forward just a hair there, you can see that both of these arrows are leaning towards the target for him. And so what does that mean? Let me get my little drawing tool out here. Um, well, that means that Jordan is actually pushing down and away from the target an equal amount that this blue arrow is pushing up and towards the target. And he's doing the same thing here. He's pushing this foot down and slightly away from the target, which creates that upward and toward the target reaction force. So he's actually pushing his feet down and away from the target and the reaction force pushing up and towards the target, which is gonna create, and it's the reaction forces that create the movement of the body. So because both of these are leaning towards the target, we know that his mass has to start moving towards the target in the next couple of frames. And so you'll see where his pelvis is right there. And if I, let me clear that. Those. If I get rid of this thing, there we go. And advance it a little bit, you're gonna watch, look where his pelvis is going. His pelvis has translated from, it was like right here a second ago, and now it's over there. And if you know where the ground reaction horses were pointing back there, you could have predicted that happening. Because that's what Newton told us, right? Forces have to come before motion. Forces are going to be the things that either cause or stop motions from happening. Um, and then the, the second part here, um, looking from the front, that's really important is now you notice that both of those forces are pushing backwards or they're angled backwards. So he's actually posting up through that lead side and pushing down. Uh, let me find my little arrow tool. There it is. So he's pushing down and forward into the ground and the ground is pushing him up and backwards. So that's creating that breaking force or stopping his pelvis from moving forward. Both really essential uh, elements to uh, every golf swing is having being able to get some of that horizontal force to produce some translation, some golfers a little bit, some golfers a lot, um, but then obviously having to break that forward translation and transfer that momentum to the club. And then if you look down the line, 
we can see how he's trying to rotate. And you'll see in his backswing, if I go back to the backswing here, you'll see that those vectors create kind of a V. You can see how the one coming out of his trail foot's acting backwards, and the one coming out of his lead foot is acting forwards. So that means he's actually shoving his trail foot towards the ball, which is creating a reaction force shoving his trail hip backwards. So that reaction force, because that blue vector is kind of tilted back a little bit, that's the thing that's going to shove his right hip away from the ball. But then the reaction force coming out of his lead side, he's actually trying to drag his lead foot away from the ball. And that reaction force is going to shove his lead hip towards the ball and create that rotation. And then what happens in the downswing? Well, those things are going to reverse. So there he's at the top of his backswing. When we get into his downswing, now they've reversed. Now the one coming out of his trail foot's acting forward. So it's going to hip away from the ball and create the rotation of the downswing. And so everybody knows if you've ever seen a golfer's uh, trail foot slip in the downswing, the, the trail foot always slips away from the ball. Um, and so that's how he creates rotation. So understanding these vectors and how they create some of the forces that are happening in our swings, it can really help us understand how to create some uh, good drills. And so I always show this one too. If you uh, have not seen this, I'm sure you um, probably, uh, I'm sure most people have probably seen that. So to me, the really interesting thing, so we're going to see that torque force, right? So he's trying to pull this trail hip away from the ball or trail foot away from the ball and lead foot towards the ball to create the downswing rotation. But since there's no friction between his feet and the ground, his feet slip. Uh, the really interesting thing to me is where that club impacts the ground. So if you watch, he's going to hit it about a foot and a half fat. Um, and when we talk about our kinetic sequence in a little bit, you're going to understand why he hits the ball a foot and a half fat. So you'll see where he contacts it. See where he, the, the low point there uh, was here, uh, which is not ideal. Um, and that's because if we understand our kinetic sequence, we can understand why on ice after he slipped during his torque force um, that he hit the ball a foot and a half fat and, and wasn't able to shallow that thing out and make contact with it. So our horizontal forces, uh, this is just in rows here. And what you'll see in, in most golf swings is you'll see a positive spike somewhere around the top of the backswing and a negative spike somewhere around impact. And so you can see just in rows as positive and negative spikes are somewhat symmetrical, which is probably a good goal for a lot of people. What does the positive spike mean? Again, that means that he's pushing down and away from the target and the ground is pushing him up and towards the target. And so that creates some positive momentum causing his pelvis to translate towards the target. But then what does he have to do? Well, then he has to jam on the brakes and the brakes are right here. So that's that negative force where he's now pushing towards the target and that ground reaction force is pushing back. So he's breaking that horizontal momentum uh, and transferring that energy to the club. Uh, and this horizontal movement or this horizontal force in the, in the golf swing is something that a lot of people used to assume was bad in a golf swing. Uh, sway. You know, you don't want to sway in your golf swing. That's terrible. And, and I would agree, you don't want to sway excessively, but some golfers, you're actually going to see some. And some golfers taking away their sway or taking away their horizontal force will actually make them worse. And so we need to make sure that we don't uh, take away some of the things that might naturally work for them. And, and I'm one of those golfers. If you take away my horizontal force, um, I don't hit it very well. Um, and so one PGA Tour golfer who does use a lot of horizontal force is Charles Howell III. So you can see, again, the very first thing I look at when I look at ground reaction force patterns in golf swing is what is their dominant ground reaction force pattern here or style. Um, and if you look here, the, the torque barely makes it halfway up to the tour average. The vertical makes it right to the bottom of the tour average and the horizontal is above the tour average plus one standard deviation. So obviously that is his dominant ground reaction force pattern. Um, now, I don't know if that's optimal for him, but it's just what he was doing that particular day. Um, I think this was around 2014 as well, where they collected this information. Um, I don't know if that's optimal for him. Um, I've talked a lot to uh, his former coach, Dana Dalquist, uh, who I'm doing a seminar with in California in a couple of weeks. And, and he thinks that if, if we had him measured him recently, um, that he wouldn't look like this anymore. And he thinks he's altered these patterns and swings a little differently than he did, uh, whatever this would be, seven years ago, six years ago, whatever that is. Um, but it is possible because even back then in 2014, you know, Charles Howell was still winning golf tournaments and making lots of cuts and making lots of birdies and playing good golf. So uh, it is possible to use horizontal and still play really good golf. Uh, but if you're going to use the horizontals as a dominant uh, ground reaction pattern, you better have that breaking force um, to stop that horizontal motion or stop that horizontal force. 
Um, and so I've really become in this breaking force because um, the most I've ever measured, which is right here in Curl, Kyle Berkshire, the current world long drive champion, um, he produces 37% of his body weight or 80 pounds of horizontal breaking force, which is the absolute most I've ever measured. Um, so if you look back here um, at Justin Rose, you can see he's producing 25% of his body weight. And obviously Justin Rose weighs a lot less than uh, Kyle Berkshire. So 25% would be nowhere near the, uh, how do I get back here? The 80 pounds. So he's producing almost double. Uh, well, not double, but two thirds, two thirds more um, than what uh, Justin Rose is producing. And so I think this is something that is really important how to create these breaking forces because there'll be a lot of um, amateur golfers that you'll see that can create tour level horizontal forces, but just have no chance of breaking it. And to me, that's not a very effective strategy uh, to creating efficient golf swings. Uh, one thing we found uh, also working with Brian Gay, who just won a couple of weeks ago uh, on the PGA Tour. Um, this was him, I think, again, maybe pre-2015, so 2014-ish. You can see he's got a ton of horizontal force, but barely any breaks. You can see he's putting in 24% horizontal force, and his breaks are only 9% before impact. So he's not breaking a whole lot of the energy that he's putting into the system. Um, and obviously, a PGA Tour player swing and driver at 105 is not ideal. There's not a whole lot of... Uh, not a whole lot of uh, golf courses where he can compete uh, super well swinging in at 105. Um, but this was him right before the tournament at Riviera in LA. And you can see he's really altered his ground reaction force pattern now, and now he's swinging in at 112. And this is actually a little slow for him. They, he says he can get it up a lot higher than that. Uh, well, maybe not much, but maybe 115-ish was what he does outdoors uh, more often. Uh, but now you can see he's got 19% breaking force. So he's really posting up through that lead side and creating a much different amount of force. And you can see that his horizontal force now isn't as quick and spiky. It's got more of a, a, a slower rate of force development um, through the downswing or through the backswing and early downswing. But in the late downswing, he really jams on those breaks a lot quicker. So um, some of the changes that he and his coach Joe Mayo made uh, golf swing wise could be the reason for that. Also, you know, some of the stuff that he does, he works closely with one of our ambassadors, uh, Ben Shear, who is his physical trainer. So some physical training, some uh, golf swing drills, some golf swing uh, mechanics alterations are could be the reason why he's now able to jam on the brakes and produce uh, a lot more speed than he did uh, previously. I didn't really like this at the time. Um, and that's why he missed a whole bunch of cuts, I think, uh, before he... Uh, before he got it all together a couple of weeks ago and actually won. So uh, really interesting to see how these things change um, as, you know, golfers work on different things and, and get with different teachers and, and try to, you know, get better. Uh, the second force that we talk about is our torque or rotational force. And you can see the torque force has a little negative blip in the backswing and a big positive blip in the downswing. And so the negative blip in the backswing is that, um, trail foot vector acting backwards. So they're pushing their trail foot towards the ball and their lead foot acting forwards, the reaction force acting forward. So they're trying to drag the lead foot back away from the ball. Uh, this is something that actually helped my swing quite a bit because I used to get really horizontal and really lateral in the backswing. So the cue to me to help take the club away was just to try to push my trail foot towards the ball. So if I could try to shove my trail hip towards the ball, that created that hip going backwards more and less, or backwards away from the ball and less away from the target um, and create a little more negative torque in my backswing, which allowed me to produce a little more positive torque in the downswing and, and help me control an, uh, my excessive rightward path like uh, Brian Gay had going there, um, which I've been known for my blocks and my hooks. Uh, and then in the downswing, obviously we do the opposite. Uh, so this is where we got that trail foot vector coming anteriorly towards the golf ball. So that means you're dragging your trail foot backwards away from the golf ball. And then your lead foot is pushing towards the ball um, and the reaction force pushing back away from the ball. And this is your torque um, that you get on the downswing, which is that positive spike there. Obviously the positive spike, because we're producing that torque at a much higher rate and much faster to try to rotate towards the ball than we do on the backswing. So this little negative blip is never anywhere near the positive one. Um, one player on the PGA Tour that we found is whose dominant ground reaction force pattern is torque is Boo Weekly. So his swing would look a lot different. You wouldn't see a lot of pelvis translation in his swing. It would stay very centered and he'd turn around there. 
because you can see he's got barely any horizontal, barely any vertical, but he's top of the tour average torque. So this was Scotty Hamilton who sent us this. Um, he worked with Boo for a long time and he has a very centered type of golf swing, which is gonna create a lot of torque or gonna need to create a lot of torque. Um, and so from what I just told you, um, you have to decide which of these two players you think is a, a dominant horizontal player and who's a dominant torque player. Um, that's, uh, so this is a, a I think somebody put this on Instagram or something like that. I forget where I got this from. Two golfers trying to hit with their feet on little half foam rollers here. So you can see this guy's got, and so uh, each foot on a foam roller and she's got the same thing. And so if you try to push down and away from the target, let me draw my little vectors on here so you guys can visualize this. Um, so if you try to push down and away from the target and have the ground push you up and towards the target, you can do that on these foam rollers, right? Because it'll resist that. But if you try to push your foot or pull your foot backwards away from the golf ball, ooh, now we're in trouble, right? Because this thing's going to roll. And so we're probably not going to get that reaction for shoving the hip forward. So if I'm a, a horizontal dominant swinger, I might be able to make something resembling a golf swing on these foam rollers. If I'm a torque dominant swinger, I'm not going to be able to do much. So let me see if you guys can figure it out from what we just said. <laughs> So you can see he's able to produce a swing, doesn't have very good breaks, but still could make a golf swing, her not so much. And so I would say if I had to guess, he would have a lot more of the purple graph, the horizontal force, not very good breaks though, she would have a lot more torque. And obviously, you know, that's probably not ideal. Um, and this is probably the absolute worst drill you could possibly do for her. Um, because if she does a few of those, she's going to realize that I don't want to create torque in my downswing or else I'm going to fall down and hurt myself, which is the first goal of my brain is to not uh, fall down and hurt yourself. Uh, good question, Casper. Uh, what drill would you use to add more breaking force? I will show you a really good drill to show you how to add more break force in about five seconds here. So you teed me up really well for that one. Um, so obviously she's a torque player, terrible drill for her. I don't know if it's very good for a horizontal player either to do that drill, but uh, definitely awful for a torque player. Um, all right, let's move on here. Oops. Uh, and last we have our vertical force. So our vertical force is the one that I've been thinking a lot about recently um, because, you know, this is the one that when I was a kid, you know, a lot of golf teachers would try to take out of the game. Uh, so if you were a kid back in when I grew up, which was the kind of the 80s, the middle 80s was I, was I was playing junior golf. Um, if you were a junior golfer who liked to jump at it, um, a lot of golf teachers would try to engineer that out of your swing. They were like, I remember golf teachers saying, you know, this isn't basketball. We don't jump in this game. Uh, and they'd get on their hands and knees and they hold your feet on the ground as you would hit balls and try to engineer this vertical force out of your swing. Uh, but this is something that a lot of people are now using um, to create pretty efficient and powerful swings. Um, so you can see this is the most vertical force I've ever measured in my lab. This guy had 1,788 newtons of vertical force just on his left leg. So what you should probably be asking right now is, well, how much is that? I don't know. Uh, and if you use Newton's second law, which is force is equal to mass times acceleration, and the acceleration we care about in the vertical direction is gravity, well, we can figure out that that's about 182 kilograms or 400 pounds of vertical force on only one foot, uh, which is pretty impressive. There's a lot of forces happening in some of these long drivers and the people who hit it a long ways. I imagine, um, you know, Justin Thomas and, and guys like that would be producing uh, similar magnitude level ground reaction forces in their swings. Uh, and Jordan Spieth is one player who, who you can see that's his dominant ground reaction force is the vertical. Um, and so one thing that I think he might need to work on is just the timing of that force, which is important. So you can see, we'll get into timings in a second, but uh, it, this is not optimally timed um, because as Newton told us, forces need to come before motions. And if our force is happening almost near where we're hitting the ball, then it's too late. So we need to have forces happening well be before that. Uh, and we'll get into that in a second. The most vertical force we've measured on the uh, Swing Catalyst 3D motion plate is 300% vertical. Um, and, you know, 300% vertical. This is Justin James, the long drive guy. This is at Liam Mucklow's facility in Canada. Um, he's producing 300% vertical of his body weight. And if you think he probably weighs about 200, uh, or 100 kilos, I'd say he'd be 220-ish pounds. Um, so he's creating 300 kilos worth of force in his uh, in his downswing, which is obviously, you know, this is on our current 3D motion plate, which is just one particular plate. So that's the forces coming from both feet. It's a pretty incredible amount of force that these long drive guys are producing. 
Um, and so when I first started teaching this stuff, I would always kind of say, you know, most of the long hitter, all, I, would, I think I did make the statement the odd time, all the long hitters that, that I've seen on the 3D motion plate create a lot of vertical. And so I think a lot of teachers and a lot of players have gone towards, okay, if that's what they're doing, let's add more vertical if I want to create more speed. And so I think a lot of people went to that. And a lot of people started to try to produce more verticals to create more speed. And I think you got to be a little bit careful um, because we do have some evidence that some long hitters that can really match it do not have a lot of vertical. So here's Gary Woodland. Uh, this was sent to us by uh, Bernie Najar, who's one of our ambassadors in uh, Baltimore, Maryland area, just outside of Washington, DC. Uh, and you can see that his torque is off the charts, but his vertical is actually very low and he kills it, right? He's one of the longest guys out there. Um, and so that is something that if, I mean, our hypothesis is if you try to add vertical to his swing, you, you might uh, screw him up. You might make him hit it worse and slower. Um, and so it's not always just pumping up all of the forces uh, to get more speed. Um, you got to be more strategic about it. Um, and another thing that I've been thinking about recently, because uh, I actually have been talking to um, Ian Poulter quite a bit recently, um, Ian Poulter is having a pretty bad back. So he played in Scotland, I think at the Scottish Open recently where it was cold and rainy and, and he kind of aggravated his back and he's been having back issues ever since. Um, and this was one of his swings on the 3D motion plate a few years ago. And you can see he has a significant amount of vertical force, but it's happening after the ball's gone. And you'll see this quite often where there's a tiny spike of vertical that actually helps him speed up the club, which is before the, he hits the ball. But then after the ball's gone if you have a big massive spike of vertical that could be pretty dangerous i'm thinking because you can see right here he's in the mode where his brain is telling him the job's done right he's in eccentric deceleration mode where he's trying to slow the club down slow his body down the ball's gone the work's over let's relax uh, and he gets this massive spike of 341 pounds of vertical force going through his body um, that's something that i think could could cause injury and we've seen some anecdotal evidence recently of of this second vertical spike um, leading to injury. And so this is something that we've, we're gonna try to do some work with after the masters uh, with him to hopefully try to get rid of this second vertical spike and make this swing a little safer for him because um, he is having some uh, low back issues. So that's something you might wanna watch out for and, and, uh, and a good way to do it is to help them release a little more. So one cue that I've seen work um, is to have them do kind of an Eneka Storm Stam or um, Jeva Duval type swing where they're trying to turn their head more towards the target um, earlier so that they don't have this. You can see his head is, is right down. I've also seen some people alter the chin position. So if you just swing with your chin up a little bit more and allow your arms to swing underneath it and not kind of jolt your head up with it, um, that is one thing that I've seen alter that, that second spike as well and make it a little bit easier for you to uh, to swing with a little less force going through your body late in the swing. So this is something that I've seen anecdotally and we're going to do some more work with, uh, with Ian hopefully to try to, to get rid of that second spike and make it a little easier on his back. Uh, but when I talk to golf teachers about trying to um, trying to use the ground reaction force plate with, with any player, I kind of give them the analogy of an amplifier for let's say a, a musical instrument. So if you take your guitar and you plug it in, or if say you're singing uh, and there's an amplifier that will amplify your sound, um, you know, if you have a really good sound person, they're gonna alter these three dials to make you sound good. And if you sing and then your buddy gets in there and sings, they're gonna probably have to make these a little different to make your buddy sound good versus you. And so, so, and so what golf teachers can do using ground reaction force plates is make a hypothesis. I think this person has really low torque. I think if I added some torque, and turn down the horizontal, maybe their golf swing would be better. So you give them some drills. Yeah, some torque, you turn down the horizontal, you have them hit again and see how it sounds. And what is the thing that tells you how it sounds? Well, it's your, it's your launch monitor, right? Your launch monitor is gonna tell you did the path, did the face, did the angle of attack, did the swing direction, did the club head speed, did the smash factor, did all those things get better? If they did, you're probably on the right track. If they didn't, well, let's adjust the knob some more and see what else we can do to make this sound a little better. And it's never about uh, just cranking them all up because to me, that generally creates worse things than, than better things in most people's swings. So you got to be a little smarter about it than that. And so how do we coach ground reaction forces? Well, one really good um, method, and this gets back to uh, the question we had there to Casper's question, um, is using something I like to call, or I don't call it, uh, it was Gray Cook, the guy who invented the functional movement screen and has worked a lot with uh, Titleist Performance Institute. He, he kind of coined this term called reactive neuromuscular training. So reactive neuromuscular training basically says 
you want to pull the person in the opposite direction of where you want them to produce force. And so this was an American football player who um, had a really bad pattern in his, his standing long jump. And he ended up actually tearing his ACL because we know that when your knee goes into this position, that's a big predictor of, a, of an ACL tear. And I've seen a lot of you know coaches or strength trainers in the gym, if somebody's doing this while they're squatting, they'll go in there and push their knees out for them. And if you push the knee out for them, you're doing the work and the person's doing nothing. So they're not learning anything. Uh, one of my good friends in Philadelphia, John Dunnigan, if you've never studied any of his work, I highly recommend it. Uh, he's doing a certification course right now called the Skilled Coaching Alliance, uh, where they're applying motor learning strategies to golf instruction um, with my good friend, Dr. Will Wu. Uh, if you haven't heard those names or you haven't heard of that, I highly recommend you look it up. It's called the Skilled Coaching Alliance. They do, do um, online training um, to understand how to use um, motor learning, proper motor learning strategies or good scientific principles of motor learning and golf instruction, which a lot of golf instructors in the past have, have basically butchered those, those good uh, scientific practices. Um, so what he likes to say is whoever does the work does the learning. So if I'm in there pushing your knees apart, I'm doing the work, you're not doing anything. So the golf teacher is doing the work, not the golfer. And so the golfer is learning nothing. And so by this strategy, if you have somebody who does this when they jump, what you want to do is actually pull their knee in more as they're doing exercises. And so that cues her to say, oh my God, that's terrible. I got to stop it and I got to activate the muscle to stop it. So this is what we call reactive neuromuscular training or like John Dunnigan likes to say, whoever does the work does the learning. And so if we go now to horizontal forces, you can see that if I want our, my golfer to create more horizontal force towards the target, what do I have to do? Well, I need to pull them away from the target. And we know, oh, well, I'll get into the timing of these ground reaction forces in a second, but where we want the horizontal force to peak is somewhere around the top of the backswing. So I would take them to the top of the backswing, I'd wrap a band around their pelvis and I'd pull them away from the target. And if they don't know how to push this foot into the ground, and you know, let me draw my vectors here again so you guys can have a, understand this a little better. So if they don't know how to push this foot into the ground down and away from the target and create that reaction force that's gonna fight me and not pull them over, I'm gonna pull them over and they're gonna fall off this little platform here. Um, and that, but that's a good thing. If you do that at the start and they learn from that and then they learn how to push their foot in the ground better, that's a good thing. And so this is uh, how to teach somebody to create more horizontal push off or horizontal um, positive horizontal force. Um, and again, you want to do it at the correct time. So right at the top of the backswing is generally around where most people uh, have this uh, force peak and where they create the most amount of this. And so that's where you'd want to take them before you pull them with the band. Breaking forces, if you look at where Kyle Berkshire's breaking force happened, it happened just before a club parallel in the downswing. So late downswing is where you'd want to create more breaking force. And what you do is you have them swing through and when they get to about club parallel, you pull them in the opposite direction. You pull them towards the target. And so if they have no breaks in their swing, if they can't push that foot down and towards the target and create that reaction force acting up backwards and away from the target, then you're gonna pull them over and they're gonna to walk towards the target. They'll do like a whoop carry player walkthrough drill. And so this is a good way to do it. You just yank them towards the target and let them figure out how to shove that foot in the ground and create that breaking force. And generally what you'll find is you'll see them start to post up better through that lead side. A lot of times that'll get them to clear that lead hip a lot better and it can create a lot of things. And that's the best type of coaching in my opinion, when you can give them just one drill where you're not cueing them at all. You're not saying anything. You're just saying, don't let me pull you over. And then they start to figure out a lot better movement strategies that can help them uh, move the club in a much more efficient way. Um, this is a really cool drill. I've had a lot of success with this one. Um, then if I was going to coach torque, well, coaching torque again is where your feet are pushing in opposite directions, right? On the downswing, if I'm creating downswing torque, I got to shove that trail foot or drag that trail foot away from the ball to shove my trade up forward and pull my lead foot away from or push my lead foot towards the ball to shove my lead hip backwards. And so um, I've learned a lot about coaching torque or creating torque from George Genkis, who I've hung out with quite a bit in LA and done some work with him on his, uh, on his coacher certification programs, online ones. Um, and you used to see videos of George Genkis kneeling down behind the golfer and actually spinning the golfer open. So his hand position here, he's actually pulling that lead hip backwards and pushing the trail hip forwards or the trail leg. So he's doing the work, right? He's the one who's spinning this kid open. So George is doing the work and this kid's not learning anything, in my opinion, um, and which might help him hit it well today, like while you're just in front of him. So as soon as you spin him open, the next ball might be a good one um, if he needs more torque in his swing. But did that teach him anything? I don't know. That's a question I, I uh, would, would have to ask. 
Um, and so I've talked to George quite a bit about this, and I wasn't sure George was actually listening to me until uh, I watched George on uh, Chris Como's show on the Golf Channel. And you can see here now he's working with Matt Wolf on the driving range, and his hand position has changed. So now he's got his right hand on the front of Matt's hip. And so if Matt wants to bring this trail hip forwards, what does he have to do? He has to push through George's hand. So he has to push that, whoops. So he has to push that foot or pull that foot backwards more and shove that hip forward. And you, you can't see where his lead hip, hip hand is, but it looks like it's on the back because you can see the front of his hip. So if he's on the back there now, now he's actually spinning uh, Matt into more of a backswing and he has to push through to get into more of a downswing position. Um, so that's doing the opposite, right? That's reactive neuromuscular training. Uh, this is a drill that uh, Mike Adams likes to use yep. to create more torque, um, where he puts that stick across the top of your thighs and you have to learn. So you see that stick, that band is producing tension, trying to turn you into backswing torque and you have to push through it to create that downswing. The only problem with this drill is I think it's very geared towards somebody who creates torque off their trail leg. Because you can see here, the stick actually comes away from the guy's lead leg and it's mainly his trail leg that's moving that stick through. So if you are a rear dominant or a rear leg dominant torque producer, I think this is a really good drill. But if you're not, if you're more of a front leg dominant torque producer, I would do the opposite. I would do the pulling towards the launch monitor here. And you see the first one, I kind of beat her and she falls over. So you see her eye pull too hard. Whoop, she fell over and she learned from that. And what did she learn the next time? Boom, how to do it much better and create that ground reaction force that pushes her uh, lead hip away from the ball um, and creates that lead side door torque. So this one I've had a ton of uh, success with as well. This torque uh, drill also teaches you how to post up through your lead side a lot better. So you see how that leg posts up much better when she gets that proper push into the ground and doesn't fall over. Um, so it can accomplish a lot of really good goals too. Um, and I've actually seen horizontal braking force and vertical force go up after doing this drill as well. So you never really know uh, what's gonna happen uh, until you apply the, the drill or the training to the individual in front of you. Uh, so that's a good torque drill, vertical force drill. Here's a vertical force drill. You just wrap a band underneath. This band's a little too lax. I would put a little more tension into it, but you wrap it under their foot and their goal is to stretch that band in the downswing. And so you can see getting her to come up and stretch that band in the downswing is a really good vertical force drill. I was actually recently at a facility where a guy had a little belt that he wrapped around his waist um, and the belt hat came with some straps that he put uh, two bands that went down the back of his leg and he strapped them onto his left ankle. And so as he bent down those things got some slack in them and then he had to tighten them and push up against them. So both of those would be examples of vertical force, reactive neuromuscular training, which is a really good way to coach torque or um, to coach ground reaction forces. And this one does specifically a lead leg dominant vertical force drill. If you're more of a trail leg dominant vertical force producer, you can use this one. So you can see here's bench here pushing kind of down on this golfer and back towards the trail foot. And if you push down and towards the trail foot, that's gonna teach you how to push through that uh, right leg a little bit more. You could also do this one by wrapping the band around their lead shoulder and then around their trail foot. So it creates that vector pointed from the trail foot up through the lead shoulder. This is gonna create a little bit more horizontal force and vertical force, I think. So this is one, and it's one thing we've learned from doing a lot of this research is you can't just make one change in a golf swing. All right, is, uh, should I take a little break here? Is, is Mark? Yeah, Mark is here, Scott. the last 20 minutes i've watched the last 20 minutes or so oh perfect awesome so tell me um i'm really interested to hear i mean how you've been because you've had the plate for how long now oh good question because of lockdowns and stuff it's hard to know probably i don't know four or five months now i reckon okay and you um i remember we started talking even before you had your plate so you were just kind of like um yeah well it came in two halves I, ha I had the pressure and then the 3d force came second and then we were in lockdown so i couldn't actually get that installed because right i'm not much of the old diy kind of <laughs> <laughs> i know what you mean i know what you mean but 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 we've been talking quite a bit about yeah. um you know about ground reaction forces and how they can be used in swings and so if you just want to talk a little bit about, you know, what you've learned about ground reaction force, how it's helped your own swing. I know you said you've gained quite a bit of speed um, yeah. from, um, so if you just want to chat a little bit about what you've learned about ground reaction forces, how the, the force plates helped you learn it, and uh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, certainly. Well, I mean, it's been, for me, with any bit of new tech, I kind of 
go on a crash, crash, crash course on myself first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I literally spend, I mean, I was hitting balls every day for as long as I could on the plate, just trying to manipulate every reading on it. Right. Be always with a new bit of tech, if I feel I know how to move any of those numbers separately and together in relationship to my thoughts it's a it's a star in base for me to then help the next person and the next person so as soon as i know how to move them i try to suggest that with the next person if it doesn't work for them i then start kind of evolving my language if you like to try and make sure i can tile into what their feelings so it was really good fun to get on there and just like go crash course on myself and look at my swing in a way I've never been able to look before. That's the biggest thing. What the 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 plate does is it allows me to see stuff that I've never known how I ever have used any of those forces. Uh, certainly, in the quantities, in the orders um, that I use them. So that was really really interesting. And then when I started doing quite a bit of testing with golf clubs for reviews that I do reviews on my content. Yeah. We had the new tightness driver release, so I got uh, about five or six amateurs in to try this club, but I got them all on the plate as well. Yeah. So interesting to, like you were saying there, A, learn what their dominant forces were, how mm -hmm. they were using them or not, the way they used them to encourage good and bad movements was really, really interesting. And yeah. then what was really interesting to see is how certain movement patterns, when you start to understand how they're pushing and using the ground some movement patterns just make so much more sense than they ever do right. you know yep. like the golfer who just constantly loses it off to the right yeah like my only drill before that was trying to control wrist angle stroke face and some yep. of them ramping wrist so hard i'm thinking like why like this should be going so far left for this <laughs> yeah it yep. isn't and then you right. see them make a back swing where they load on their right and then heavily on their left and stay there. Yeah. And you think, All right. Well, that's why I'm having the ramp the wrist so hard because yep. they're just so far ahead of it. They can't yep. recover anything down at the bottom. And so, that's a good way to, to wreck some wrists. <laughs> yeah, it's a great way to take loft off for one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, for some golfers, it's just not enough. Like they just right. cannot do that recovery enough. So you need sure. other weapons. And to be yep. honest, that's what it gives me. It gives me basically a whole new set of tools and weapons to allow me to really see and understand. Because these are things that they don't understand as well. Like some no. golfers on a launch yep. runner understand that they present too much loft because they tell you the ball goes too high. Some golfers right. on launch monitor understand they hit it out the hill because they hit a shank they can feel it they want to know <laughs> yeah but exactly. they can articulate a bit more of what impact i mean obviously lots can't but some can right the ground the audience as i would call them because we're obviously my students are an audience based as well as physical people yeah just, the understanding and how using the floor has been taught in the past is where we were teaching the swing before launch monitors. It's 2D based. It's yeah. it's so basic right and left. That's all yeah. it is. Go on to the right, go on to the left kind of ideas. Yeah. And again, when you start measuring them, you just see there's just a whole new world of tools that you could use to, like you were saying in your presentation, just to make sure you're not butchering a swing too much, basically. You know, right. to try and get your launch monitor numbers correct for some people you do have to butcher a wrist angle a grip a setup unless yeah. you do understand a bit more of where and how they're getting into those positions which for me right. it just opened up a whole new world which is fantastic i mean i wouldn't want to assess a golfer without that it's a, i have the same feelings as i had when i first got a launch monitor when i first got a launch monitor 10 or so years ago you know, it just opened, it was like, how could I ever teach without this tool? Right. I was guessing so much before and I could just get to the root so quickly. And it's exactly the same feeling when we start using the graphs to help golfers. Um, totally, and I, li I like your idea of, you know, when you first got it, you tried to alter the numbers and, and I would be the same way when I first got a launch monitor, right? How can I make this path go like 10 to the right? How can I make it go 10 to the left? How can I hit down on it five? How can I hit up on it five, right? And you start to figure out, oh, that kind of, and then I think the cool thing is the connection between the ground reaction force and the launch monitor numbers. 
So I'm not even going to think about my launch monitor numbers. How can I make that angle of attack go? What can I mess with with the ground? And I've done a ton of that um, as well. And I think that's a really cool thing is seeing, because really the launch monitor is what happened in the past, right? It was yeah. what it, you did to make that thing do the, the, to get the launch monitor, you don't really know, right? <laughs> you could have done a million different things to make the launch monitor do what it did. And, and what I hear a lot from people too, is like a lot of people in the past, you know, I guess it's kind of the, you know, David Ledbetter, Nick Falfo kind of working on positions. I want to look pretty here. I want to look pretty there. I want to look pretty there, but there's no gas behind it, right? There's no, there's no force behind the whole thing. So you can slap it out there, but you look pretty the whole time. Um, and I think what we're starting to learn from PGA Tour players, who cares what you look like? hundred um, percent. I mean, right. one of the biggest things I've learned as someone who grew up very much in that era that you talk about, um, and my swing would look, you know, on camera, my audience yeah. which is relatively decent size, but it's a lot of general, just normal day-to-day -day golfers. Mm -hmm. They want to look the way I look. Well, right. that, only swing at 105 is a massive problem that they're not <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you see what i mean it, it's so yeah. funny where wh when i get on the plate what and i'm really doing it lately actually as i'm trying i'm doing a speed challenge with uh, andrew rice and martin chuck at the moment online yeah. we're trying to raise our speakers obviously it's very topical at the minute and it's just a good message for the audience to understand something that they can play with as well yeah i'm learning that i spent most of my amateur and early pro playing and swinging career trying to limit movement where now i'm actually doing the complete opposite i am adding right. massive movements well what feel like massive movements to me right and then i see him on the camera and i look at the plate and they're tiny movements <laughs> really time to watch the video of me it is so funny you've got three middle-aged guys trying to go at it in this video because we're all yeah. swinging around the same speed so right. and 105 quad we're like 108 to 110 kind of stuff right we're all equally unimpressive obviously <laughs> that's face control we can hit it straight because like, right yeah he's oh, a lot you can just hit it straight sure um, you hear us grimacing and going for these shots all of us right. Martin, like hitting it and falling off um yeah Andrew Rice is like smashing it and falling off and he's looking down at the launch monitor and it's like it's no different in speed or it's slower sometimes yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. how can that be that speed he's saying and right. I have one yeah. shot I, think, I have get that so hard for me and I look at it and it's you know 111 well, how's right. that not 113 that, that felt so different yeah but when you dial it in to the launch uh, to the force play you can see well I might have put more force in but I didn't get it out at the right time to get any of it on the ball Yep. So I'm a notorious, I get a lot of vertical, but I'm a quite notorious of being a bit late with my vertical. Yeah. Happening as I, I'm peaking as I'm almost hitting the ball rather than kind of getting, on. I, I'm better if I'm peaking my vertical when my lead arm is parallel to the ground. So as early as Perfect. possible. Perfect. That's yep. when I start getting most out of it. Um, and it's just so noticeable. Yes, I can feel the energy because there's a big yep. spike, but doing right. it at the wrong time is not helping me get it on the ball so that's why i'm looking at the launch monitor and not seeing a difference right. if you take the plate away i'd be scratching my head to know why that wasn't fast sure yeah no and the the timing of forces is something you just can't see with your eye it's impossible right. with the iphone video camera with a i mean even 3d motion capture systems if you have like a, a whatever k vest or gears or any of those things you just can't see that with your eye and that's where you can make such big differences and you, you teed me up pretty well there well let's let's have a look actually let me share my screen again we'll have a look at your swing here God, my swing is forever developing it's so interesting yeah that is interesting in time i've had the play right so, so you got to, i mean these, these these numbers are pretty good i mean 112 yeah that is and so this is where you know if you're so this would be, if I look at your swing to start with, um, I mean, obviously, you know, you're hitting up on it. That's a really good thing. The path and the face are not going to hit it off the planet anywhere. Um, pretty good well, smash I'm, factor. I'm notoriously straight. That's my right. guess. I am yeah. like, I would bore you to death. If we played, people don't want <laughs> It's just straight, constantly. Yeah, that's not a bad thing at all. But uh, so to me, what I would look at first is I want to see the connection between your, and this is what we'll get into in just a second here um how much you get into your trail side and um your dominant uh, ground reaction force pattern so you get about the maximum amount you get into your trail side is about 80 percent right here on the right and so um i've done a lot of pga tour players and the range is massive we have some pga tour players 
I always tell the story, uh, Sean Foley called me when he first got his plate and was working with Cameron Champ and he said, my plate's broken. Like Cameron Champ's only getting, so Cameron Champ only gets 45% of his pressure or 50-ish into his trail foot with his driver. He gets no move off the ball. Yeah. Um, and so he's very stacked. You can see he has a very narrow stance. Um, all the stuff that he does. Uh, and I was like, Foley, why don't you hit on it just to make sure? And he hit on it. He's like, oh yeah, it's fine. It's, I guess that's what he does. And so it's weird. You, you, you wouldn't really guess that, but he doesn't get a whole lot of pressure moving right. And I think that's something that we've learned from these sports places. You don't have to, like that was the old method, right? Was right on the backswing, left on the downswing, or get into your trail side and get into your lead side. Not everybody does that. We got some players that play some really good golf and produce a lot of good speed without that. Um, and then we got some players that get like hundred percent into their trail side. And so our hypothesis is how will you use these grand reaction forces is going to depend on how much you get into your trail side. So if you get 100% into your trail side, you better have a lot of this horizontal force to push you back to the lead side. Um, if you say stacked on top of it, kind of more like a Cameron champ, you're going to need a ton of vertical force. But you're kind of halfway in the middle, right? You have a very neutral pressure shift, um, which tells me you, you could probably use more of this yellow graph, this torque. Um, so if I was going to try to get you some more speed, it would be torque related. Okay. Um, so those those drills that I just showed, the torque, the rear leg dominant and lead leg dominant torque production, production drills, I would start pulling you with bands with that with that stick behind you or a golf club behind your back um, and try to really work on creating more rotational speed. Because I think that's where, based on this pressure shift, if we don't want to mess with the pressure shift, we can just try to ramp this up. And if we got this up to the tour average, I imagine uh, that would be where you would uh, get a lot more speed and probably have it more effortless speed. Because um, yeah. that's what, that's we find quite a bit, you'll, you'll change the ground reaction forces. I can just play this for people when they have a look here. Looks like you look at the launch monitor the whole way back, or what are you looking at there? <laughs> Doesn't look like you're looking at the ball. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's funny. Um, but that's what you'll find quite a bit. Like I've done this often with people where you've got them more efficient with the ground and they feel like they're just chipping it. And the launch monitor is either, either showing you similar uh, speeds or even higher speeds. Because if you're using the ground efficiently, it doesn't feel like effort, right? If you try to speed it up yeah. with your hands and your arms, that feels like effort, that's hard. Uh, but if you use these big powerful muscles in your lower body, then it, it just feels like easier speed. And I think, you know, people used to talk quite a bit about, you know, uh, Ernie Els, right? It just looks so effortless. And, and I think if you measured his, what happens to the ground with him, which we haven't yet, but it would be interesting to do, um, yeah, you would probably see a lot going along around all, going on in the ground and it obviously being timed perfectly. And, and all those things result in kind of an effortless looking swing to your eye, but still a lot of speed and obviously he hits it pretty far um, for, you know, a senior tour guy uh, or he, I mean, even in his day, he hit it pretty far. So um, yeah. that's the stuff that I think is super cool. And uh, let me see some of the timings here. So let's look at your vertical force timing. That's vertical not horrible. Timing as well. Yeah. The vertical is so re it, it, it's really, I'm doing some tests at the minute on, how long it takes me to get warm and what my speed is pretty average yeah. not warm to warm and i'm jumping like six miles an hour not warm to warm right and, it, and it's my vertical my vertical is really late if i'm not warmed up so your students yeah. are coming and getting out of the car and getting to you quickly and hitting balls like they could be taking 20 minutes before their pattern in the ground actually makes sense to what they would do on the eighth tee of their course right because it takes me a good i mean i'm 45 so your average yeah. student's probably my age up unless you teach those juniors or what have you right. <laughs> but i was certainly teaching a lot of middle-aged man when i was teaching a lot it's the yeah. demo golfers isn't it um yeah. uh, you know it takes me a good 20 minutes to get anywhere near this vertical getting to this early it's all right. the club is down by my knee when I'm peaking the vertical until I am warm. Um, right. That was one of the biggest standouts for me because, you know, I've played loads of golf where I don't actually hit many balls. I go on a chipping and putting green because I feel like yeah. I'm going to hit straight. I don't need to go and hit balls. I'm going to hit straight. I just want to get feel and touch. Yeah. Uh, looking back at that, like there's five holes of me leaving 15, 20 yards just sure. in the tank because I'm not warmed up and stretched properly, which was most. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And, and I actually have that in my presentation. I was going to get to it here in a second. Let me go here. Um, so the timing of the forces is really important. So the horizontal force, you want it to peak somewhere near your top of the backswing. You'll find in very kind of reactive athletes, sometimes it'll peak before the top of the backswing. Um, and then it needs to end somewhere by the uh, lead arm at 45. So to me, if I go back to your swing here, let me see. Um, so 
the horizontal force, your peak would probably be about there, which is, you can see your club still, oh no, it's made transition. So it's kind of right at the top of the backswing. But I would want to make sure that it, it peaks by about here. And you can see yours is definitely on the way down by the time that lead arm gets to about 45. Pounds. And that's a lot. That's because I'm so unstructured. I think lower body gets a bit unstructured and I've always got really deep arms. So I'm spending, right. what's my pressure trace is hilarious. So I go right, right, left. I then go right again to then go left because I'm just yeah. lying that the, center of gravity of that head up. I am literally going back, forward, back, forward. Yeah. So my trace used to go back into the corner yeah. halfway on the downswing. It's something I've actually, by increasing my vertical, has allowed me to get my trace not so back, forward, back, forward. Yeah, it's there's a tiny little bit of that, but not much. So you can see how it kind of bounces be, around they, here, a hair, but I yeah, not too bad. Yeah, when I first got on the plate, that, that was one of the biggest things I tried to change because it was just, you could actually see me doing it. Yeah. It was just me lining up. It was me just lining up thinking, I can't hit it from here, so I'm going to go back here to yeah. then go forward. It was so interesting. interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. And, and another thing now that I look at this where, you know, I was talking about that Kyle Berkshire breaking force, there barely is anything. No like, so you can see it's just kind of, and this is where, this is your nervous system kind of freaking out here. So see how this kind of bounces around there? That's your nervous system, your 45 year old nervous system going, what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> so that, that's, uh, so to me, if there's something that we could do, um, and this could be something, you know, in the gym, if we got working on that left hip a little bit more, or uh, even that drill where, you know, get you to about this point and have somebody pull you towards the target and see yeah. if that helps you jam on the brakes a little bit more. And that yeah. one could also help you produce more torque, right? Because as you jam on that brake and, and straighten or pulse through that lead side, uh, it could shove that left hip backwards a little bit more for you. So um, all of those things. Uh, so that would be the two things I would look at would be to try to create some braking force here to add some speed uh, and then maybe add some some torque, which could be the same drill, right? The same drill yeah, could probably well, accomplish both of those things. That. For me, yeah. I think from what I've played with, I would say they would do the same thing. If I was to increase talk i reckon yep. the breaking would also jump up as well because I've, yeah. I've actually played with that one what happens when i try to increase talk is I, I lose some vertical so then what happens is things slow down a little bit so then i panic yep. slowing down <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right but i understand it's practice like it isn't yeah. right and, but sometimes it can be so i mean have you tried i would say that breaking force drill that i showed you would be a good one so have your buddy like take a slow motion swing, even if you don't have a club in your hand, because I've tried it with a club in your hand and sometimes it gets close to like smoking the guy with the band. So it can get a little dangerous. So maybe yeah. if you got a little tiny club or some, or not even with a club in your hand and just as you get to around this point, like beyond left arm parallel, just before club parallel, have them yank you towards the target. See if you can throw the brakes on and not fall off, fall off the, yeah. the plate. Um, yeah. That would be a really interesting one. And it might cause the vertical to go up more. And if this yeah. breaks more and this goes up more, I guarantee you, you would add more speed from that. So um, those are some really cool things that you could work on there. Um, and then the other point I wanted to make, so these are my timings that I was going to go into. So the torque is between lead arm uh, at 45 and lead arm parallel. Um, and so let me go back here and see how you did with that one. So your peak it torque happened. Normally around lead arm parallel, I think, or yeah, just below. That's perfect. Or just below, yeah. So this is just before. So that was really well timed. So yeah. whatever work you've been doing for, and then uh, our vertical force needs to be between lead arm parallel and club parallel. And so you see yours gets. Which that's something I've got better at. That that was yeah. when I first got the plate. Yeah. Mine was like the um, the um, Spieth trace right. without his yeah. proper shoes on that's what yeah. my vertical used to look like right and that's uh, that's in yeah. and that could be that i mean that could be one of the main differences of where you went from 105 to uh 112 there so that's uh that you see that quite a bit that's a, a really easy way to increase speed um is to get the timings of the forces better um and so i have another little slide here on working on timings so if you want to work on timings i would say 95% of the time, unless you're working with PGA Tour players all the time, you're probably going to make, you're going to be working to make forces happen earlier. Um, I don't know if you've had a lot of different caliber players on your plate, Mark, but generally the forces are too late, even in good players. Um, yeah. It's only yeah. with really high speed players where you might be having the forces happening too early. 
Um, and generally what we find is, because um, I mean, we, we talked about the kinetic sequence there um, without actually mentioning it, but the kinetic sequence is uh, horizontal force peaking first right there, torque peaking second and vertical force peaking third. So uh, there's a guy in, uh, in Alabama named BJ Trulio. His son's a really good player, played in the US amateur last year. Um, and he, he used to teach a drill called, he called it skate, spin, and stick or something like that. It was some kind of acronym like or uh, rhyming words basically, but so it's horizontal first, torque second, and vertical third. And so if you make kind of a horizontal shift rotation vertical type swing, uh, and this could be a good drill to use with, you know, juniors or brand new beginners, because if they get that kind of sequence of shifting a little horizontally, then going rotational and then going vertical, um, that's probably the closest thing to a universal truth that I've seen. Uh, using the ground reaction force plate. <clears throat> um, but what we find is a lot of times if you alter this last one, this vertical force, then the rest of them will alter in time as well. And so getting this vertical force peaking at the right time can be super important. And so some of the things that you can do and, and some of the things I like to do are just set up modifications because they're the easiest things to do, right? Just set them up in a slightly different position and see what happens. Um, so if you reduce the lead foot flare, and this could be something that, you know, if you have to go to the course and play without warming up. So, I mean, it happens, right? You get stuck at work or whatever it is. Uh, for the first five holes, you might wanna just square up your lead foot a little bit more. Because if you square up your lead foot, that allows your, your lead leg to straighten or to post up a lot sooner, which creates a vertical force a little bit sooner. Uh, you can also shut your stance a little bit. I mean, how many people on those first five holes hit a lot of slices? Um, probably quite a few when they're not warmed up, right? So uh, just reduce the lead foot fair and close the stance. All those things help us to uh, post up on that lead side a little bit earlier. Um, and then also preloading the forces earlier. So a lot of people will watch like Rory McIlroy and see his head drop in transition um, and say, well, I'm supposed to stay tall and drop in transition. I mean, because that's what dropping is, right? Dropping is kind of preloading your vertical forces. But um, I would say 99.9% .9 of us do not have nervous systems like, like Rory McIlroy, right? I mean, he's an incredible athlete um, and there's something special about what he does. Um, and so I've had, you know, with older people, if their forces are always late, I've had them just squat a little bit more at setup. And so they have more time to get that vertical force happening at the correct time. Or, or you can get them to squat a little bit in the backswing or, or create that preload a lot earlier. And obviously you do the opposite if you are going to move the forces later, um, which would be adding more foot flare, opening the stance and staying taller longer. So um, I would say in my what has it been six years now using this ground reaction force plate, I've probably gone to these things a handful of times uh, with you know young people who are in the 120s of club head speed. Um, and this I go to this probably every other day. <laughs> this yeah. is the kind of thing that you see quite often. And, and I don't know, I mean, I, I, if you want to kind of maybe address, like, why do you think that might be? You've studied golf instruction, and I mean, I think there's an epidemic of late forces, and, and I kind of, one of my hypotheses is, you know, TPIs made early extension like the cardinal sin in golf. Oh, yeah. So I mean, everybody's, I, yeah, yeah. everybody's I, I, staying in yeah. posture forever and, uh, and not releasing their forces in time, which I think is costing speed. So I think we've almost, you know, I, I think of everything as a continuum, right? There's this and there's this, and the answer is generally somewhere in the middle. Um, and if we go to way to one end or way to the other end, I think golf instructors kind of shifted towards that staying in posture. And um, and I think, you know, maybe with ground reaction force plates, we can move back to the center a little more. Yeah, well, and like you said it, you're seeing it on PGA Tour now so much more. Golf instruction for myself, as in receiving it, was always about restricting. It was about holding hips. It was about right. feet on the ground. It was about not going into certain positions. It was all about restrictions where what the force plate does, uh, and I think, and I agree, you're seeing it with golfers now, like Bryson's just thrown every restriction out the window, isn't he? <laughs> He's right. pushing it the complete yeah. opposite way when it comes to restrictions. It's so yeah. much more now about the freedom of movement. And if you think about timing of forces, if you limit your, if you restrict movement, you're going to restrict when someone's able to jump, how high they can jump, how far they can jump. Like if I'm going to yeah. do the long jump, I'm going to take a run up. I'm not going to do it from static. Sure. Right. I'm going to right. make explosive run up and go. And um, yeah. if you can, if you can teach your students to have any kind of strike stroke uh, face and path awareness, while at the same time giving them freedom of movement, you're just ticking so many more boxes nowadays. Um, sure. and, and foot flare and Whitford stance before the plate came are things I would have been 
much more skeptical of as a coach like without measuring them oh i've moved my foot and it's so much better you've heard and i used to think oh really are you that much better like does it make (laughs) and then i started hitting shots with left foot totally sprayed out and my horizontals just go through the roof my vertical disappears i'm thinking this is like this is massive and then i'm both feet straight on and my torque slightly increases and my vertical creases and then my horizontal just goes like flat line and i think old player can't go vertical let's go nice yeah. and wide turn that lead foot out and just sway and hit it bro. don't try yeah. and do what i'm doing do your own right. match. Um, sure i think again i i think it's the restrictions that i do think the lead better era it's unfair to always say the lead better era no it, i agree yeah i, 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 I know yeah. you're it's like yeah because it's like he's a um it's because he was so successful it's now it's time sure. for him to be punished isn't it it's like the human right. to do that, sure. and, and you do the best you can with the information available right that's all you can do at the time and i, I mean i always tell the story my uh my colleague who retired when they hired me in the kinesiology department at my university said when he first started in the 70s they used to hot box the conference room everybody was smoking in the kinesiology faculty uh faculty meetings like and and you think about that you're like what are you talking about but like you know, I think this was the late 60s or whatever. People didn't know better. So you, you got to do the best you can with what you know. So, yeah, no, I agree. I, I don't mean to, to talk bad about it. He's done a tremendous yeah. amount. But I, I do think that era was very much about restriction. I mean, Faldo was yeah. the model of restrictions, wasn't he? Right. He yeah. posed the boy for that era. He's still, he's starting to actually free up a little bit more now, it seems, which is good in his ideas. But he was very much the model of hitting positions and very restricted, calm your right knee down, all that kind of stuff. And then yeah. we take it to GG, what he's doing with Matt Wolf and things like that. It's fantastic to see these guys coming out with such freedom and movement and at the same time with the same levels of club face control. Um, and oh, we're able, yeah, yeah. We're able now to quantify both. We can measure the club face control and we can now measure how fast they're going precisely, but let, we can also work out where that's coming from. And I think we're seeing sure. freedom of movement is actually allowing people to increase speeds and give them certain other skills when it comes to club face control because my strike is loads right. better if my forces are timed correctly instantly my strike yeah. but i spent yeah. most of my amateur career thinning it short right of greens always safe make paths from short right you know i'm never flying a green and that's because it, i was spending the first four holes not warm and getting out and getting my verticals out and i was just sliding horizontally and never quite getting yeah. that club down to the ball um, right. Like it's so obvious now when I can measure it with right. the tools that we've got. So, yeah, and it, I, I'm the same. I was a uh, I was a decent player when I was you know 10, 11, 12. I'd shoot 75, and then I grew a foot and a half in a year, and my my little baby draw turned into a snap hook. And I grew up playing ice hockey, so I go very lateral in my swing, and I think I just overdid it. Right when I got taller, the levers got longer. That inside. I got gliding so much that path got so far inside and and everyone just kept weakening my grip to try to make it go straight because right you know that's where you go to that's where we used to go to and weakening my grip actually makes the face shut more for me so the thing was coming back at me it was awful I was like and you know when you're 13 you don't have the mental capacity to, yeah. <laughs> to deal with that when you used to be able to start it up the right and bleed it to the center and shoot 75 and now you can't break 90 um that makes I mean you're gonna you it's interesting you say that the two young people I've got on the plate because I don't have loads of juniors because just because I'm predominantly producing content um, and because of the price I charge juniors wouldn't be paying for right. that's, yeah. that's a business discussion but um, gotcha. my daughter who plays who's uh, who's she's athletic she does you know she's done gymnastics and she's sporty her, her graphs just fantastic like it's just naturally sporty yeah. because she's jumping right. she's whacking there's no restrictions she's just i've no. always we play for fun and she's 15 year old uh, young woman carrying it 215 220 so she's like yeah. smashing it and i look at her graphs and i just want those graphs but <laughs> if, yeah. i think if she grew up when i grew up she would have been being taught to restrict because she's a left foot lifter she's jumping and she smashes it like she yeah. plays with club members and they're like Cool, she hits it a bit hard, doesn't she? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that's what you meant to do. Right. Like, it's be not what to go. Um, and then I had another young guy on who was a tennis coach. He was like 17, 18, tennis coach, athletic. He was just perfect. All tour averages, all in order. 
Like never yeah. had golf lessons really, just could hit it. He needed some club face control. His grip was like in a position that was making him get twists in there, but striking it pure with speed, just without thinking about it. And I think right. we would teach that out of him in years gone by. And there's we still would, yeah. coaches who still will be teaching that out of them because there's coaches, you know, the position based ideas are still there. And I don't mm -hmm. know what I'm, like, I'm not blaming those coaches, but it's opening your mind up to what te technology is allowing us to understand more, to maybe think, maybe I don't need to restrict. Like, I need to respect, restrict this guy's club face. He was getting it six close and snap hooking it. But right. I don't need to do that with perfect ground reactions. I need to do that by now looking at some of the nuances of his wrist angles and grips and setups. Um, but I would never restrict someone like that before where in days gone past, you might have you might have yeah back into it fairway that kind of idea which yeah yeah and i think i mean i always tell people believe it or not you can smoke and drink while doing this game but it's still a sport right we want to be athletic and and yeah. uh, and you don't want to coach athleticism out of this game and i think that's what we're learning from guys like matt wolf that he's just such an incredible athlete and he can and he does some crazy things i mean i, I remember that interview after he won the first time and faldo was interviewing him He's like, you're supposed to put the butt of the club at the ball on the way back. You pointed the opposite way. Like, what the, did that page in the golf instruction manual get all folded up wrong or what happened? And it's, he's, so and what, Matt, when, when, it's so interesting with Matt Wolf. I look at his backswing and I just look at his knees, how yeah. far his left knee has come across, how much he's turning his hips. And I just think I want that leg movement because yeah. my leg movement was limited, hence my swings. But he has got no, they're seeing this. I'm not seeing that because... He blatantly has got club face control. He wouldn't be a sure. PGA Tour player if he didn't have no. club face control. Look, totally. what, not only do I see legs that are as big as my body, so I'm thinking <laughs> I want those legs full stop. Yeah. I'm just going to sure. be happy. I'm also right. seeing him using them in a like he's using them in a 50% more powerful way than me, and he's 80% right. more powerful than me. Um, yeah, that's not a competition, is it? You know, it, no. it's like he's going to win. Yeah. Um, it's, it, I think it's interesting, like you say, what the media still do and the, the, the norm looks at. They look at that. I don't look at that. Like if he's controlling the face and striking it, if he's blatantly is, right. I literally don't care where that goes. Look at sure. the size of the guy, one. Yeah. And then look at how he's using his body, two. He's an athlete right. and he's using it with like, if you got club face control, that's a winning ingredient, isn't it? No, basically? I agree. So we had a little question from Philip here. Um, how can you screen or test people um, to give an idea what their dominant force would be that they're using without using the plate? And so um, one that we have used in the past, let me see if I can load up uh, this here. Um, and again, it just gives you an idea this test. I, I don't, I wouldn't take it as gospel, but I would, you know, it gives you kind of an idea where to start with, with people. And all you need to do this type of test is with your launch monitor. Um, and so I would have people, where's my picture of this one? And I've got I'll a question about this as well, which will lead on sure. to... Sure. Okay. Well, let me find my little picture of my testing protocol there. Um, where is it? It was in this presentation somewhere. At one point, it was in there. <laughs> let me see if I can find it. Um, like certain feet together one, is that... Yeah, right? yeah. So that's that's basically what you do. Is you hit with your feet really close together and... The theory is, I'll dig up that picture somewhere else. I can't find it. Yeah, but. I mean, a great example of that is, so I'm, I if I'm off my left foot only, so right foot in the air, left foot only, opposite the ball, yeah. I feel I can hit that almost as hard as if I've got two feet on the ground. Feet right. together again, I feel like I can hit it almost as hard. Right foot, I think, why would I ever hit it off my right foot? It makes sure. Sense. Right. The guy and I film with, Matt Lockie, he put him on his left foot alone, and he's like, this. why would I ever do this? But he wants to be on his right foot. Yeah. Now, Matt, when he swings, he peaks his um, vertical, like Carl Ber Berkshire, like up here. Super early, yeah. And it actually early, yeah. goes into the minuses before impact, like Kyle does on his trace, which I've never seen apart from long drivers. Right, And he's yeah. just, but, like, he's so, as he comes into impact, his left leg is going away from the target, where I'm the opposite, I'm bending my knee out and like getting onto my left side. So we're complete opposite, which that test just shows straight right. away. So right away. And you got to teach those people differently. I mean, I was actually with a kid is interesting at Oklahoma State University last week, this kid, Austin Eckert, and uh, he was better off his right foot as well. And he told me that his right foot slips quite a bit in his downswing. And the coach was like, I got to get him new shoes. Yeah. 
And I was like, you don't got to worry about his shoes. You just got to keep him on his trail side more. And he said, you know when it's the worst when I'm trying to punch it into the wind? Because how do people teach punching? So, well, stacking on your left side. And so and anytime he's sack, yeah, he's trying to use that right foot, but there's no pressure on it. And so it was interesting to me because then I did the test with him. And when he hit it with his feet together, he launched it way lower and kind of hit a little punch shot. And I was like, I say that's that's your punch shot move, not stacking on your left side. Because if you stack on your left side, that right foot's always going to slip on you because his engine's different, right? The way he uses his body is different. And so we need to teach him slightly differently. And traditional golf instruction, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Oklahoma, but it's windy as heck there, right? Like you're always playing in the wind. Yeah. And so, you know, him, the traditional style of stacking on your left to, to knock it down was just not working. Um, and so it's really interesting. I, I think that's a great test, Philip, to, to just hit with your feet together, then drop one foot back, drop the other foot back. Look at the consistency or the solidness of strike. Uh, I mean, uh, Foresight called it efficiency. So the the, uh, the smash factor and look at club head speed too. Just see how much, where you can create speed. And, and it's interesting, like I always tell people to hit with their feet together to start with and they hit one. And then I say, just drop one foot back. And the foot they choose to drop back with is generally their worst one. Like there's no way you would ever drop your left foot back to start with, right? If I didn't yeah, tell you which always, one to do. Yeah, and I agree. I think as well, not sometimes the launch monitor, like you can see patterns, but obviously with an amateur, you might not see many patterns because they'll just whiff it a bit when you start. <laughs> right. But it's listening to their grimacing. That's what yeah. I know. Listening yeah, to them going, or to just fiddling, like I can't do it. One side they won't fiddle, and the other yeah. side you'll see them like like they've got an itch. They'll just <laughs> like, like they can't so strike either one leg because they're not that good at striking it, but they definitely moan a lot when we put them on the right leg. So right. Yeah. No, that's great. I think that's really good. So yeah, as much as your launch monitor is cool to see the numbers, yeah, just looking at the human being and see how they react to to those different conditions, I think is really awesome. This was great. The mic. Sorry. Go ahead that is will do people even though they've got a dominant power source can they possibly be getting it wrong so i'm applying this to me at the moment so i'm a front leg poster i did some testing yep. with jason floyd did some over our original lockdown using the mike yep. adams stuff for working out yeah, yeah. Like front leg poster so you need lots of vertical which you can see in my swing yeah but at the moment as i'm trying to hit harder and harder and harder the more i feel i try and get more onto my right leg and push off my right leg i actually feel like there's chances that maybe i've just been getting it wrong so the security of delivering club path and yep. face has made which i feel more comfortable on my left that might not mean that's where i'm my fastest but that's why i've yep. taught myself i'm my most comfortable so mm -hmm. have you seen any evidence of people in your testing, even though they test for one side, actually they can get some better numbers if they try the other side? Right, I 100%, yeah. And that's where I think you have to be flexible, right? And so um, I talked about John Dunn, and I've been studying a lot with him and he, he uses the, uh, the Goldilocks phenomenon. I don't, is that a story in the UK? Have you heard of Goldilocks, three yeah, bears? Yeah, three bears, yeah. Okay. yeah. I was working with Gabby Lopez, who's from Mexico, and she looked at me like I had 10 heads when she said that, when I said that, because like, I guess that fable doesn't exist in Mexico or whatever. I don't know. Our, our culture is very <laughs> intimate. <laughs> All right. Um, but that, that would be something that I would try. Like to me, like I would try to like whenever I get with somebody like and, and I would say if your goal is to hit it in the fairway, then I would say what you're doing is good. Like, like you know, if your goal is to hit in the fairway and make birdies and, you know, like I think what the path you've gone down is really good, but if your goal is to hit it as hard as you possibly can and beat your other old buddies and get more club at speed, then I would fiddle with it. Yeah, <laughs> I would fiddle with it because um, to me, but the matchup of how much pressure you get into your trail side and what your dominant force is. So if you're going to try to add more horizontal force, I would want you lifting that lead foot and, and getting 90% of your pressure more into your trail side and then introduce more of that glide or that horizontal force and, and just see what happens. And if your speed starts going up, I'd be like, cool, because like what I found is human beings are just so messy. I'll test somebody I, 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 and like, exactly, totally, yeah, yeah, like yeah, just, and that's where you know I, I was going to show some stuff, but I think constantly, don't they? Right, and I, I've run out of time, but um, I was working with uh, James Richard and and Francesco Molinari recently, and and he got into doing a lot of vertical force work um, and testing him. He looks pretty, you know, lead side dominant, um, but he was getting way too much pressure into his trail side, and, and he already had tons of tons of vertical. So, you know, we were like, you know. Set, and then James wanted to change something about some look of how his pelvis was working. And that made his pressure shift very neutral, about 80%. And then I was like, well, if you're 80% and you like that pressure shift and, and you can see when he hit it like that, it, the little light went on in his head, Francesco, you know, he was like, Ooh, I like yeah. that one. And I was like, okay, cool. If, we, if we're going to do that, if we're going to go down that road. Let's add some torque. Cause I think that's where we're going to get our gas from. And we gave him a couple of torque drills and then he was flying it like 
15 yards further and he was super happy. So I think just keeping all of this in your head and, and trying to figure out the puzzle that's in front of you. And I really like your idea of, of looking at that human and see, you know, when does that light go on? And that, that triggers them. Like, you know, when they hit it and they're like, Ooh, that was different. Like that was good, whatever that was. And then you measure it and you say, okay, cool. I think we might go down that road and then, then a different road. Yeah. So I, I don't like getting too rigid with anything to do with human beings because yeah. you never know. I mean, and there's so many, you know, we've worked a little bit with Matt Kuchar and if he hits one ball that goes left, that's it. He's done with it. Like whatever he's doing, it could be way more speed. It could be way better for months. And then he hits one left and it, he just has that mental scar tissue. And I think I'm kind of closer to Kuchar too. I hooked it so many times as a kid. And I hate to see it. I would rather slice it off the planet than hit a hook. And so even though maybe I can hit it further if I try to hit draws, but it just, you know, in my mental scar yeah. tissue, that, that, yeah, that doesn't work to me. So um, yeah, really interesting talk. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Uh, Sergio, are you still there or did we lose you? Uh, you have the most <laughs> What's <Mark>. up, man? <laughs> um, any more questions from anyone out there? How are we doing time-wise? We're perfect for time. I think most of us all want to go and watch the Masters. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Well, we'll let you guys do that. I'm going <laughs> to do the same. <laughs> you guys, it's, it's happy hour time there. It's only one o'clock here. So I'll, I'll let you guys go have a few uh, cold ones and watch some golf. No problem. Thanks, guys. Appreciate all the support. Thanks, everybody, for your signing in this week in lockdown 2.0. Cheers. Thanks, guys. See Cheers. You later. Take care. Bye now.